All right, good morning, New Life. I got you, I got you. So tomorrow night, my uh, Buffalo Bills get to take on the surprisingly and annoyingly good New England Patriots. Like, I thought, I thought, thank you, go Bills. I thought once Tom Brady was out of there, the Bills would be sitting fat on top of the AFC East for years to come. But apparently, apparently Bill Belichick's a good coach. I hate to say it. But he'll probably end up on some all-time greatest NFL coaches list someday, and he'll be up there with Vince Lombardi, okay? You know, people who love football say that Vince Lombardi's the greatest coach ever coached the game, built a dynasty in Green Bay. You know, most of us maybe know a little bit about that, the Green Bay Packs in the 1960s, but some of us don't realize that that dynasty was built on the heels of defeat. December 1960, the... Green Bay Packers scored off against the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFL championship game, and they squandered a fourth quarter lead and lost the game. For six months, they were devastated, and so they were very anxious to get back to training camp that next year to, to up their game, to bring it to the next level, to new, learn some new plays. That's why it came as a complete surprise to them when their head coach, Vince Lombardi, he gets the team together and he holds up a pigskin and he goes, gentlemen, this is a football like, yeah, coach, and that's why we're paying you the big bucks. Okay, like, where are we going here? And, and he says, guys, uh, we're not going to be touching the football for a while because we got to go back to the basics. He says, we're going to go back to practicing the fundamentals, blocking and tackling. And they, he said, if we master the fundamentals, we'll win the game. And while the rest is history, they went on to win five championships in the next seven years, two of which being the first two Super Bowls. So let's, I'm going to work on my, who, okay, coming for? All right, good try. Hopefully I play for New England. I'm Mac Jones. I'm Mac Jones. You, oh, <laughs> Woo. all right, Josh Allen, baby, Josh Allen. See that spiral? That was good. All right, so we're, we're starting off a brand new teaching series today called This is a Football, Faith Back to Basics. Well, we're going to just go back to some fundamentals of our faith. Because if we can master them, we'll, fat, we'll master our, our faith walk with Jesus, we believe. The first several sessions, weeks of this series are going to focus on the person of Jesus. What do we believe about Jesus? Dr. James Allen Francis answered that question this way. Listen to this. He, he wrote this. He says, here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home, never wrote a book, never held an office, never had a family, never went to college, never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen long centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. Out of all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. Why was Jesus' life so impactful? How did he make such a difference? It's, well, I would say because he wasn't just a man, but because he was the almighty God who wrapped himself in flesh. And the life that he lived in this earth was just a tiny fraction of his existence. And so why do we believe that this itinerant preacher was God? Well, that's the question we're going to ask today. But before we dive into that question, would you pause for a moment and pray with me and ask God to speak to us today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we want to welcome you into this conversation. We want to hear from you. Pray that you would open up our hearts, open up our ears to hear what you want to hear, and we can have the courage and the boldness to take one more step closer to you. We can experience more of your joy, more of your peace in our lives. We can share with the world around us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So why do we believe that this 
humble carpenter was the Almighty God. Let me give you a few reasons. Number one, because of what the Old Testament prophesied about them, about him. Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures written hundreds of years before Jesus, like Isaiah 9 6. Isaiah 9 6, let me read it here. For a child will be born for us, and a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of peace. Now, many of us are probably familiar with that verse because it's in that song, right? You know, that song, like, like, for unto us a son is given, right? And he shall reign forever and ever, right? And what wonderful counselor, the mighty God. It's like, whew. Wow, you know, I should probably leave that for the Philharmonic, okay? But we're familiar, right? We're familiar with the song, but we're not as familiar with the significance and the meaning of the words here. This is Isaiah. He was a prophet, lived in Jerusalem 700 years before Jesus. He was ever placed in a manger, ever dirtied a diaper, ever teached people, ever taught people. He, this is 700 years before Jesus, and Israel is facing a hard time. The northern kingdom of Israel had recently been conquered by their enemies, the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are knocking on Judah's door there in Jerusalem. And King Ahaz, who's king of the southern kingdom in Judah, is, he's shaking in his boots. He's like, we're, gonna, we're next. We're going to get conquered. Like, we're dead meat unless God does something incredible. But he doesn't really trust God. He's not sure if God's really there or mindful of them and their situation. And so he begins brokering deals with other nations, with Egypt and Syria, to protect them. And Isaiah says, Ahaz, you don't need to do that. If you trust God, he will show up in a powerful way. He'll protect you. But Ahaz doesn't see that. All he sees, right, is the earth level, all the enemies that are coming. And, but Isaiah says, hey, God is the God that does an impossible. I know it seems impossible, but God can do the impossible. And, and get this, he says, one day, you know what one day God's going to do? He's going to send to Israel a child, a son, a boy who's going to be a man. But you know what? He's not just going to be human. He's going to be the mighty God. In the Hebrew, it's El Gibor, always translated mighty God. And so to a Jewish mind, this is a contradiction in terms. How, how could a man also be God? God's not a human. God is out there. He is transcendent. You can't be both man and God. It didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. But per perhaps that's why God gave us 700 years to get used to, to kind of swallow that pill, which is really hard to swallow. Now, sometimes I hear people say, but Sean, how do we know that maybe early Christians, how do we know that they didn't kind of mess with the text of Isaiah and maybe give a new word and maybe put the El Gabor in there so it made Jesus look like he's the mighty God? I hear that sometimes. And that, that, that might hold water un, until 1947 when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And uh, in these caves in Qumran, out came the big scroll of Isaiah, which archaeologists date back to way before the time of Jesus written down with us a copy of a copy of Isaiah. And what does the big scroll of Isaiah say? This coming son would be the El Gabor, the mighty God. So Christians didn't tamper with the text or change it to look like Jesus. No, Jesus came in fulfillment of that prophecy. Another prophecy that Jesus came and fulfilled is Micah 5.2. Another verse we're probably familiar with. It says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah, one will come from you, ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. So, pop quiz. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. That's right, Bethlehem. That's right. In fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, second question. How old does Micah predict this coming ruler would be when he comes to become king? How old does he predict he'll be? Let's just put it this way. You thought Joe Biden was old. <laughs> this ruler, the text says, would be from ancient. He would be ancient. Some, some Bibles, maybe the Bible you're reading, says his coming forth is from eternity. That's what, the, that's what it means. He's the eternal God. He's one that preexisted the world. Micah is saying, get ready. I know it doesn't make sense, but God does the impossible. Right? So, so some reasons why we believe that Jesus is God because of Old Testament prophecies pr predicted, got us ready to accept someone who will not only be man, but would also be God, eternal. 
Another reason why we believe Jesus was God was because of his virgin birth. His virgin birth. Isaiah predicted the virgin birth in Isaiah 7, 14 when he says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive and have a son and name him Emmanuel. You know, what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. God with us. Now, virgin birth, it's, it's hard, to, hard to believe sometimes. That's why the late talk show host Larry King was once asked, if you could interview anybody, anybody in all of human history, who would you interview? He thought for a second, and he said, you know, I would interview Jesus, and I would ask him, are you indeed virgin born? He said, because the answer to that question would explain history for me. See, Larry King understood the pivotal nature of the virgin birth. If Jesus isn't born of a virgin, he'd just be a human being. But if he was born of the power of the Holy Spirit, then, okay, he's got claim to call himself God. Now, now the virgin born, I should actually say, it's not really the virgin birth that gives us a reason to believe. It's really the, the virgin conception, right? Because Jesus came out the same way you and I came out, okay? But he wasn't conceived the same way you and I are conceived through a, a mother and a father. No, but through Mary and the Holy Spirit. And it's hard to believe. I get that. It's hard to believe. But if, if you doubt and struggle to believe in the virgin birth, understand you have company, right? You have company. When, when the angel came to Mary and said, hey, you who are highly favored, look up because you're going to have a son. And she was like, no, I'm not. No, um, I think you got the wrong address, okay? I think next door, they're trying to have a son, okay? Them. She was like, no, I'm not having a son because I'm a virgin. Like, I'm engaged to be married, but, okay, we, we ain't doing it yet, okay? We're not, it's not going to happen. But she, the angel says, no, okay, it, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and allow you to have a son. And then she became pregnant, and then she believed. And, and then she's got to go and tell Joseph, her fiancé, hey, I'm pregnant. Right? And how did he respond? He was not excited. He was, yes, we're having a baby. He, no. He was in need of a wonderful counselor, mm -hmm. right? He was upset. He was angry. He was hurt. He said, well, you, you, what are you doing fooling around with me? He, and the Bible says that he made up his mind that he was going to divorce Mary quietly. He wasn't going to you know, bring public shame upon her. But he said, if you can't be faithful to me while we're engaged, why should I trust you to be faithful to me while we're married for the rest of our lives? Right? And even though all the stories that the Mary, it's not, no, it's, I'm still a virgin. I wasn't unfaithful. God did this. Yeah, and I'm Julius Caesar, right? Yeah, okay, Mary, right? He didn't believe it. Really hard to believe. I understand that. The, the reason why I believe it is because Isaiah predicted it would happen. And both Luke and Matthew say it happened. And, and Matthew and Luke, both of them were skeptical. They didn't believe Jesus was God when they first heard about him. Right, Matthew, just think about Matthew. Right, Matthew worked for the government. Some of you work for the government. Matthew worked for the government as a tax collector, kind of worked for the IRS, all right? And so one day, Matthew, he is sitting at his tax collector booth, and he's heard about Jesus. By this time, Jesus has preached to some big crowds. He's done some miracles. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes by Matthew's tax collector's booth and says, Matthew, I want you to come follow me. I want you to be in my gang. Let's go, okay? And he's like, all right, here we go. I'm following Jesus. This is awesome. Right? He's like, I can't believe Jesus wants to hang out with me. And so what does he do? He's like, hey, Jesus, can we do a, can we like throw a party? Like, I, heard, I hear you turn water into wine. Okay? Like, why don't you come over to my house? I'll bring some friends and we'll have some fun. Okay? And so, yeah, he just invites all of his friends to come meet Jesus. And you know what he doesn't say? He doesn't say, hey, um, if you've got some furniture that, that's broken, bring it. Because this guy's really good with a hammer. Okay, and, you know, probably bring a notebook because he's really smart, probably going to give us some good teachings. Okay, might turn some water into wine. Can't guarantee it, but you're also not going to want to miss because he's God. Okay, the Alpha and the Omega, not going to want to miss this opportunity to miss him. Okay, to meet him. All right. He doesn't say that. Because to Matthew, Jesus was just a man. But over time, Matthew and the other disciples begin to believe that there's something different about this guy. 
Maybe he is more than just a man. Matthew records this account. When there are one day, Jesus had preached all his day to all these huge crowds of people, and they're on their way back, back home on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and they're sailing, and Jesus is like, I'm tired, so I'm going to go take a nap. And so he just starts snoozing, and all of a sudden this huge storm erupts, and, and the waves are so big, they're crashing in over the boat. The disciples are just getting ragdolled out there. They're getting thrown to and fro, and then all of a sudden wh- the water's coming in. They're going to go down. And they're like, Jesus, they're like, you got to wake up, dude. You got to wake up. We're just getting big. Like, you can't die tonight. We can't die tonight. Come help us bail out the boat. And Jesus is like, I'll do one better. He wakes up and goes, quiet, be still. And in a moment, the wind dies down and the sea becomes like glass. And Mark says that in that moment, the disciples were wet in more than one way. They were wet in more than one way. They said they feared great fear. Like they were so afraid of how afraid they were. In that moment, they were more afraid in that moment than they were in the midst of the storm. Why? Because they're coming to understand who Jesus was, but they still don't believe he's God. This is how they respond. Matthew 8, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? That even the, sea, and the winds and the sea obey him. Like, still believe he's just a man. He's not God. He's just a man. He, God might do some cool things through him, but he's still a man. Right? So Jesus continues to give them hints that he's more than just a man. Right? There's one day he's talking with these Jewish people who don't think Jesus is very hot stuff. And he starts telling them, hey, you need a savior. You are sinful people who need to be redeemed, who need to be let out of bondage from your slavery. And they're like, no, we don't. We're good. We're good. This is John chapter 8. And they're like, we are children of Abraham. We're God's chosen people. We don't need any saving. And he's like, yes, you do. And, and you know, funny, funny that you bring up Abraham. Okay, funny you bring up Abraham because before Abraham was, I am. That's, that's John 8, 58. He says, before Abraham was, I am. It's kind of a weird statement. What are you talking about, Jesus? Before Abraham was, I am. Like, do you need to go back to English class, like Greek class, Aramaic class, like grammar, okay? Do you mean before Abraham was, you were? Like, you were there, like you were playing kickball with the universe. I don't know, like you were doing something. Not, I, you know, I am. What are you talking about? Let's, let's get our you know, verbs to agree here. No, Jesus was, he knew what he was saying. He was claiming to be God. And everybody knew it but his disciples, right? The, the, Jewish, the Jewish people knew it. Jesus was going back to the story of God appearing to Moses in the burning bush saying, Moses, you need to go to Egypt and release my people from their bondage, right? They're talking about slavery that day with Jesus. He's taking them back to that story. And when Moses says, okay, but who am I supposed to say sent me? The burning bush says, you tell them that I am has sent you to free you from your slavery. And so in this moment, this talk about slavery, Jesus says, I'm the great I am. Because not only was I before Abraham, not only will I always be, I'm always the ever-present God. With me, there is no past or present or future. Everything is present to me. Because I am the great I am. I remember the future, Jesus says, because I am, I am God. And that wasn't lost on these Jewish people, the crowd. Verse 59 says this, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple. Why were they going to stone him? Because that was blasphemy. Claiming to be God? Well, that was a capital offense. But still, the disciples don't get it. Jesus' own disciples don't get it. Everything's just like, they are not picking up what he's throwing down. Still don't believe. And so Jesus continues to drop hints. He predicts his death and resurrection three different times. Three different times he tells his disciples. Here's one time. Matthew 20. While going up to Jerusalem, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside privately and said to one of them, or said to, on the way, he said, see, we are going up to Jerusalem. It's like, yeah, we know Jesus. We've, we've been this way plenty of times. We know the routes. Like, well, I'll you guys don't get a lot of things, but okay. So here we go. We're going to Jerusalem. Okay. He says, the son of man, which is also a, a term from the Old Testament that has divine characteristics and qualities, the son of man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised. 
just one of the times Jesus told his disciples, hey, get ready. Get ready because bad stuff's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to be crucified, but take comfort because I'm going to rise from the dead. We would think maybe his disciples would be like, we should probably write this down, right? Probably remember this. But they don't. I don't know. Maybe they're just so fearful. But what do the disciples do when they see Jesus arrested? They run. They see Jesus crucified. They're hiding behind locked doors, the Gospel of John tells us, for fear of the Jews, right? They think Jesus is dead. He's been crucified. We're in his gang. We are next. None of them think, oh, no, Jesus said this was going to happen. And he's God. So everything's under control. No, they were afraid. They said, our, our Messiah, our leader is gone, and so we kind of all hope is lost. Whatever, we'll go back to our lives, hopefully, as fishermen, maybe, if we can get through this. But then three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And he appeared to those 11 disciples, those actually 10 disciples at that point, and appeared. But Thomas wasn't with them. Thomas wasn't with them. And, and so they go and tell Thomas, hey, you missed him. Jesus has risen from the dead like he's God, like you got to believe. And he's like, I'm not going to believe until I put my hands in his scars. And so eight days later, Jesus appears to them again, and Thomas is with them, and Thomas sees that Jesus feels him, is able to feel him, and he says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And and he wasn't OMGing, okay? He was declaring his belief that this risen Savior was both Lord Christ and the Almighty God because of the resurrection. You see, the resurrection is the receipt that they needed to prove that Jesus was God. Like, what's going to give you confidence this year? So, who's done all their Christmas shopping? Anybody finished with all their Christmas shopping? Okay, I see that hand. Okay, one there. Okay, good for you. Good for you. Okay, kind of jealous, but good for you. Um, So, the rest of us that still have to go to the mall, maybe, or just buy everything on Amazon, some of us will go to the mall, Okay. When you go shopping for those Christmas gifts and you get that PlayStation 72 or whatever it is these days, okay, and you're getting ready to walk out that door, what gives you the confidence to walk out that door? Well, you see those sensors, right? You see those sensors, and you've seen it, right? You've seen people walk out the door and it goes beep, 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 and you're like, I don't want to be that person, right? And even if I am, I can walk out of that door, and when it goes beep, 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 what are you going to show everybody? The receipt, right? You're like, here it is. I paid for it. Not stealing anything. Not a shoplifter. Nope, not me. Right, because that receipt proves that you paid for what this thing is worth. And when Jesus died for us on the cross, his life on the cross was sufficient payment for the sins of the entire world. And if he was just a man, that wouldn't be justice. It wouldn't have been able to atone for the sins of the entire world, but it did because he was the almighty God, right? If I killed 10 people, and I was condemned, guilty. I couldn't say, well, why don't you put my dog to sleep? Right? That, that's sufficient payment, right? No, that's not justice. But God's justice, scales were balanced on the cross because the Almighty God paid for our sins and the wrath and the separation that He experienced, the forsakenness that Jesus experienced on the cross was payment enough for your sins and for mine. His resurrection proved it was the receipt And that gave the disciples the confidence that they needed to go all over the world and tell everybody that Jesus was God. You know, guys like the Apostle Paul who didn't believe it. So he persecuted anybody who said that Jesus was God, said that was blasphemy. But then he became a Christian, a believer, when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus as he was going to put more Christians in jail. He writes this in 1 Timothy 3.16, And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. Because, yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's hard to believe sometimes, hard to wrap our minds around. But he was manifested in the flesh. It's hard, hard to believe. It's a mystery, he says. Again, he says in Colossians 2, 9, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. And God tells us in Philippians chapter 2, Why should we treat other people even better than ourselves? He says, because that's what God has done for us. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality of God something to be used to his own advantage. But he, but he became a man, and he laid down his life for you 
for me. And so the Bible says we ought to do that for one another. If God wasn't too good enough to do that, then neither are we. So now let's get a little more practical. How, what does this mean for our lives practically that Jesus is God? Have you heard much about all the UFE, UFO controversy and cover-ups recently? Like, I, I don't know. It, it goes, it's going around. It's kind of being more popularized the last couple of years, I think, because too many people are quarantined and spending way too much time on Google. Right? Just <laughs> following that rabbit trail, and it goes deep, okay? I got, I got a couple friends that I work out with, and uh, one guy's named Kush, and he's just talking about it all the time. And he's saying, Sean, you can't believe you, are, you, are you really saying that, that with how big the universe is that we're the only, only intelligent life out there? I'm like, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Like, the Bible doesn't say, like, we're the only life that God ever created. We're kind of on a need-to-know basis, and we don't need to know at this point. But, I mean, there's no evidence. I mean, I don't see any evidence. But you're right, Kush, the universe is really big. The universe is really big, right? I mean, do you know how big the universe is? Yeah, really big, but we don't know. We, we don't know because it just keeps going and going and going and going. We haven't found the end of it yet. But just to help us kind of wrap our minds around to the size of the observable universe. All right, let's take a look at this picture. Oh, right, look at that picture. Oh, look at those nice stars. Those aren't stars. Those aren't stars. Okay. So the Hubble Space Telescope took this picture. At one point, it was just dark, kind of looked like, like dark matter. Like, I don't know like if there's nothing out, nothing out there. But then they kept on refocusing and getting closer and... They're like, wow, there's light out there. There are stars out there. And they realize those aren't stars, those are galaxies. Those are galaxies, yes. Millions and millions of stars all in themselves in those light forms, okay? Here, here's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. You know, our humble home, the Milky Way galaxy. Can you see Earth there? Nope, nope. It's in there, but we can't see. It's too small. Can you see the solar system in there? Nope. We're too small, right? Let's just, let's just travel through space now. Let's say we had a spaceship that could travel the speed of light. How long would it take us to get from Earth to the sun? A little over eight minutes. A little over eight minutes. Traveling the speed of light is fast, right? If we were to go around the Earth, you know, we'd be able to go seven and a half times in one second. Seven and a half times in one second, but eight minutes to get to the sun. We're traveling pretty fast. It would take us a little over four hours to get to Pluto. You know how long it would take us to get to our nearest star just in our little galaxy? 4.3 years. Yeah, just 4.3 years traveling at the speed of light. What I'm trying to say is we're really, really small. And the universe is really, really big. Hundreds and billions of galaxies out there. And yet what God's Word tells us is the, the creator of all of that. The one who holds it all in his hands, wrapped himself in flesh, came into our story to die for our sins. It's a incredible thing to believe. You know, in 1961, we found ourselves in a race to space with the Soviet Union. Some of you were there. I wasn't there. Wasn't there yet. Can't claim that. But I, I read the history books and I, I know that we lost the race. We lost the race. Yuri Gagarin was a cosmonaut. The Soviets sent him up into space and he orbited the earth and came back down. Nikita Khrushchev, who was the premier leader of the Soviets at that time, he was all happy, he was all excited, and he goes, we sent Yuri up into space, and he looked for God, and he couldn't find him. Therefore, God doesn't exist. He was really proud of his atheism, and so, so you should be an atheist too. Well, a, a magazine from New York City asked C.S. Lewis, who was a professor at Oxford at the time, he said, C.S., can you write a response? Like, how would you respond to a comment like that? And so C.S. Lewis wrote a little article in which he he recommended, he told, hey, let's think about this critically, everybody. Okay, if there is a creator God, we shouldn't expect to relate to him like a landlord relates to their upstairs tenant, right? You got, a, you got an upstairs tenant, rent's due, like, hey, you there? Help, you know, rent's due, come on. You go up and you see him, okay? Are they there or not there? So that doesn't make sense to relate to God or your creator like that. He says it would be more realistic to relate to God as Lady Macbeth or Hamlet relates to Shakespeare, the author, their author, their creator, right? And so it doesn't make any sense for Lady Macbeth to go up into the rafters of the Globe Theater looking for Shakespeare, right? Or Hamlet to go up in a tower of the castle which he lives in. Shakespeare, are you up there? No. The only hope that Lady Macbeth or Hamlet have to discovering God, their creator, 
as if he writes something about himself in the story. And then C.S. Lewis says, but God didn't just do that. He didn't just write something about himself into the story. He came into it as the main character, as the hero of it, as the one who all of history would hinge on, as Jesus Christ. That's why John puts it this way, John chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. What is John saying? John's saying that Jesus is the Almighty God in language that we can understand. He is God's clearest form of communication to us. And we can know that even though we're just this little, little itty bitty speck of dirt in a grand universe, that our author, our creator, loves us and has an incredible plan for our world. June 6, 1944, many of us recognize as D-Day. The day 73,000 U.S. soldiers stormed the beaches of Normandy in France. Among them was Teddy Roosevelt Jr. Here's a picture of him. It's the son of President Teddy Roosevelt. He was the oldest soldier to storm the beaches that day and the, the highest ranking officer. He was, a, he was a general, brigadier general at that time. All of his commanding officers says, you can't go. You can't go to the battle lines. You're too old and you're too experienced. You're too valuable for us to lose. But multiple times he wrote to his commanding officers. He says, you got to let me go. You got to let me go. One of his letters he wrote this, I personally know both officers and men of these advanced units and believe that it will steady them to know that I am with them. And that day, with a, a pistol in one hand and a cane in the other, he led 21,000 soldiers over that seawall and into enemy territory. They eventually won the war. Why were they able to fight so courageously, to, to face death in the face and keep moving forward? Why? Because their leader was with them. He wasn't you know, standing back in a command center saying, go, go get it, guys. You got it. Good job. No, he was willing to die, to shed his blood with them, and that gave them courage and confidence as they faced, faced death. The same thing is true with our leader. Our Almighty God didn't just stare from a distance and say, you guys got this. You guys can figure it out. No, He said, I'm coming down and I'm going to not just fight your battle for you, but I'm going to fight it with you. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble to take our eye overcome the world. He told His disciples, I will never leave you. I'm going to be with you to the very end of the age. And see, so that gives us hope that no matter what darkness you're facing this Christmas season, well, I know Christmas can sometimes be a tough season. Right? Sometimes it's just the sicknesses that we, base, that we face this time of year. Sometimes it's financial difficulties that come kind of more of a reality when we begin buying presents. Sometimes it's the reminder of loved ones that are no longer with us as we celebrate Christmas. Well, what gives us hope in the midst of this darkness? It's the fact that we have a God who's got the whole situation under control. He sees the future. He sees the end of every story, and he's going to fight those battles with us. We need this type of hope. We need it. A Andrew Del Blanco is a professor of American studies at Columbia University. Uh, several years ago, he wrote a book called The Real American Dream, a meditation on hope. And in the book, he argues that every human being needs hope to get through our day-to-day -day lives. He says, hope is what helps us avert the lurking suspicion that all our getting and spending amounts to nothing more than fidgeting while we wait for death. He says elsewhere in the book, we must imagine some end of life that transcends our own tiny allotment of days and hours if we are to keep at bay the dim, back-of-the-mind suspicion that one may be adrift in an absurd world. Are we... Are we just adrift in an absurd world? It's tempting to think some days when we think about how big the universe is, how small we are, when we look at all the pain, all the injustice, all the disease, sometimes it's like, God, where are you? And Jesus comes screaming into the world and says, I'm here. I'm here and I'm making all things right. I'm going to pay for every wrong, every sickness, every disease. I'm going to pay for it at the cross. And he says, as surely as I came once, I'm going to come again. 
I'm coming again at that point. I'm going to redeem the price that I paid for on the cross. That day is coming. If you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're still checking out who Jesus is, I want to encourage you, continue searching for him. Continue to investigate who he is. I encourage you, a good place to start when you're exploring who Jesus is, is reading the book of Mark. Very simple, straightforward book about who Jesus is. You know, if you're skeptical about maybe what the Bible has to say about Jesus, read some books by skeptics who became believers like C.S. Lewis, his book, Mere Christianity. Or, or, or Lee Strobel's A Case for Christ. Read the, the Reason for God by Tim Keller. If those don't answer the questions, the reservations you have, I encourage you to email me, C at newlife.church. I'd love to just point you in the direction of some resources that have helped me. And that, now, if you are a, a Christian, you're saying, yes, I believe that Jesus is God. Here's my challenge. Over the next week, spend five minutes, just at least five minutes, maybe as you wake up or before you go to bed, and think about how big God is, how big our universe is, how small we are, and yet God loved us so much that we're on His heart and we're on His mind that He would wrap Himself in flesh and come down to not only be with us, to fight with us. And then think about the storms you're facing. Think about the battles you're facing this year. And say, Jesus, I don't know how you're going to solve this problem. I don't know how you're going to fix this problem in my marriage, but I trust that you can do the impossible. Right? You've done the impossible. We see your history. We see your track record. And I trust that you will do it in my life. And go and spend some time with him. Right? Because the Almighty God came down, wrapped himself in flesh so we could have a personal relationship with him. But every relationship requires some time, some communication. Are we giving that to him? If we do, then he can become our wonderful counselor as he gives us some words to live by. As he becomes our Prince of Peace, our eternal Father. He can be our mighty God, but we got to give him the time of day to do that. Maybe, you, maybe your next step is baptism. And it's putting your faith in him for the very first time. Whatever your next step is, I, I just challenge you to, to listen to God in the next few moments and take that next step. And I encourage all of us, just keep journeying with us through this teaching series. And next week, come back as we unpack the idea that Jesus is king. He's the reigning king. And what does that mean? How does that affect the way that we live our lives? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though you are great and you are grand and you are beyond our comprehension, we cannot fathom how big you are, how powerful you are. You wrapped yourself in flesh and gave us a ta- tangible evidence that you're there and that you love us. God, we're not worthy, but we're thankful, we're grateful. And so, God, we just pray that this week, as we come and we spend some time with you, that you would be our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our heavenly Father, our Prince of Peace. We thank you for your Son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.